Previously, we discussed the Bohr effect and we said the Bohr effect is a phenomenon by which hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide molecules bind onto special allosteric sites on hemoglobin and they decrease hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. And what this does physiologically is it allows the hemoglobin to deliver many more oxygen molecules to the exercising tissue and cells of our body. Now, what I'd like to discuss in this lecture is how the carbon dioxide is actually transported inside our cardiovascular system from the tissue to the lungs. And let's begin by focusing on the following diagram. So in this diagram, we have the cells of the exercising tissue. We have the endothelium of the blood capillary. This is the blood plasma and this is the red blood cell. So let's suppose I move my hand back and forth. So as I'm moving my arm, what's taking place is the muscle cells are producing ATP molecules in a process we call aerobic cellular respiration, which uses up oxygen and produces carbon dioxide and ATP molecules. Now, the ATP molecules are used as the energy source and the carbon dioxide molecules, because they cannot be used in any useful way, they have to be released by those cells of the exercising tissue. So we have these nonpolar carbon dioxide molecules and because these carbon dioxide molecules are nonpolar, they don't have any charge, they can easily move across the cell membrane of the cell. So the carbon dioxide molecules make their way across the cell membrane into this space and then they make their way across the endothelium and into the blood plasma. Now, once they're inside the blood plasma, what happens to the carbon dioxide molecules? Well, carbon dioxide molecules are nonpolar, and what that means is CO2 molecules will not generally dissolve in the blood plasma. Why is that? Well, because blood plasma consists predominantly of water molecules, which are polar. And polar water molecules do not mix very well with nonpolar CO2 molecules. So only about 5% of the carbon dioxide, a very small portion, will remain dissolved in the blood plasma. And the remaining 95% of the carbon dioxide will move across the cell membrane of the red blood cell and into the environment found inside the red blood cell into the cytoplasm of the red blood cell. Now, what happens once the CO2 is actually inside the red blood cell? Well, some of that CO2 will go on and bind directly onto special groups on hemoglobin. And this is what we discussed in the previous lecture. This is what we call the Bohr effect. So part of the Bohr effect, uh, part of the Bohr effect tells us that CO2 molecules will bind onto special regions on the hemoglobin molecules, and that will essentially form salt bridges, and that will stabilize the T-state structure of the deoxyhemoglobin, and that will essentially decrease its affinity for oxygen. So how many or how much, what percentage of the CO2 molecules will bind to hemoglobin? Well, about 10 to somewhere around 14% of the CO2 molecules will actually bind to hemoglobin. So for our discussion, let's assume that it's 10% so that we're dealing with a single value. So about 10% of the CO2 molecules, once they're inside the red blood cell, will bind direct to the hemoglobin and, and will travel to the lungs by being bound to that hemoglobin. Now, the remaining percentage, so we have 5% here, 10% here, so the remaining 85% of the carbon dioxide will combine with water. And by the enzymatic activity of the special enzyme we call carbonic anhydrase, the carbonic anhydrase will catalyze the conversion of these two molecules into carbonic acid. 
Now, because carbonic acid is a relatively good acid, it will dissociate into H plus ions and bicarbonate ions. Now, the H plus ions will create part of the Bohr effect, and so they will bind onto special regions onto hemoglobin, and that will decrease the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, allowing hemoglobin to unload even more oxygen molecules to the exercising tissue. So remember, we have oxygen molecules moving from the red blood cells into this area, then into this area, and eventually that makes their way into the cells of the exercising tissue. Now, what about the bicarbonate ions? Well, bicarbonate ions are simply another form of the carbon dioxide, but the major difference between the carbon dioxide and the bicarbonate is the bicarbonate contains a full negative charge, and that makes this molecule polar, and what that means is if the molecule moves into the blood plasma, it will have no problem dissolving in the polar blood plasma. And so what happens happens is the bicarbonate ions, about 85% of the initial carbon dioxide that entered this blood plasma exist in the form of the bicarbonate ion. So a special protein membrane in the cell, in the membrane of the red blood cell transports these bicarbonate ions into the blood plasma. Now, at the same time, this transport protein also pumps these chloride ions into the red blood cell. And the reason we have this exchange is because we have to ensure that there is no change in the electrostatic charge between the inside portion of the red blood cell and the outside portion of the red blood cell. And this exchange in ions, this effect, is known as the chloride shift. So the chloride shift is simply the process by which this special protein membrane basically balances the charges by pumping this molecule to the outside and this chloride molecule to the inside. Now, let's move on to the lungs. So once we're inside the lungs, this is basically what we're going to see. So we have the blood capillary, and now instead of having the exercising tissue, we have the alveolar space of the alveoli found inside the lungs. So now what happens is basically the opposite of what happens here. So now we have the reverse reaction taking place. So we have about 85% of the carbon dioxide molecules existing in the bicarbonate ion form. And so what happens is these bicarbonate ions will move down their concentration gradient and into the red blood cell. And at the same time, the chloride shift takes place, but in the opposite direction. So as we move these bicarbonate ions into the red blood cell, not to have a buildup or a change in electric charge, these chloride ions also containing a negative charge are basically pumped to the outside into the blood plasma space. And once we bring these bicarbonate ions into the cell, the hemoglobin basically releases those H plus ions. And the H plus ions now combine with the bicarbonate to form back this. So this actually should have this should be H2, so let's just use the color black. And this forms the carbonic acid. And now the carbonic acid is broken down in the reverse reaction to basically form the water as well as the carbon dioxide. But remember, about 10% of the carbon dioxide was also being held by the hemoglobin. And what happens within the red blood cells in the lungs, the hemoglobin releases that carbon dioxide, the 10%, into this bundle here. And together, the 10% released by hemoglobin, the 85% that was held by bicarbonate, and the 5% that was dissolved in the blood plasma, all this carbon dioxide basically leaves the red blood plasma cell and eventually enters the alveolar space. And then via the process of, of exhalation, we essentially expel and release all that carbon dioxide into the outside environment. And then the plants use this 
use the CO2 in a process called photosynthesis to basically produce sugar molecules, then we either eat the plants or we eat the animals that ate the plants and the cycle basically repeats itself. So we conclude that carbon dioxide is carried in our cardiovascular system in three different ways. About 5% of the nonpolar carbon dioxide is, di is directly dissolved in the blood plasma and so travels to the lungs directly in the blood plasma. About 10% to about 14% in some cases is being held by that hemoglobin and that carbon dioxide when it combines with hemoglobin it creates the Bohr effect and that basically decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and the remaining about 85% so the majority of the carbon dioxide in our blood plasma is in the form of bicarbonate ions and together all these carbon dioxide forms are transported into the lungs where the lungs eventually expel those carbon dioxide molecules to the outside in the process we call exhalation.